Hello, everyone. My name is George Lindemann, and I'm here to tell you all a story about a small creek in eastern Tennessee called Soap Creek, which is a tributary of the Piney River. And the story does, includes the Piney River as well. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to present. I'm passionate about rivers, like everyone is in this room. And being able to be a part of preservation on the Cumberland Plateau where I live has really been a treat for me and a privilege. Very exciting that I'm able to, to talk to this group of experts about the subject. Some 15 years ago, my partners and I purchased some land on the Cumberland Plateau in Tennessee. Our permanent residence in Miami Beach, but we're very interested in a natural setting, a real estate investment, a second home, a potential ecologically sensitive future development. So we looked for a lot of these features in what were the first mountains north of Miami. So where my farm is, is equidistant from Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Nashville, about 100, 150 miles north of Atlanta, maybe 200 miles. And so if you can picture Atlanta, if you go up a little bit on the map, that's where the mountain range starts. And it's called the Cumberland Mountains or the Cumberland Plateau, and it's part of the Appalachian Spine. It's the less famous neighbor of the Smoky Mountains and that whole area. And it's, as the crow flies, about 30 or 40 miles away. From my property, we see the Smokies on most days if they're not too smoky. What we ended up with was a partially clear-cut logging track of land. It started at 2,500 acres and swiftly became 5,000 acres. And we named it after the first Blue Line Creek that we came across, which was called Coal Creek. Gotten a lot of flack for the name of the farm. Everyone says, why in the world would you name a beautiful natural preserve area about coal? But there was no question that the farm was going to be called Coal Creek. That's the main creek that runs through the farm. And coal is a part of the area where I chose to live, the Cumberland Plateau. It's just um, ingrained in everything and seemed to me very appropriate, which was the notion of coal and creeks and how we all have to get along and everyone has to get together to preserve while keeping the heat on for people. So that's a bit what this story is about. We have two main creeks on our property. One of them is Coal Creek. That's the first one you come across. And then as you continue on west, there is Soak Creek and White Creek. So I guess there's three creeks on the property. Soak is the far western side. And what this picture is on the right side of the page is the gorges that are everywhere on the Cumberland Plateau. You can see it sort of in the middle right of that picture. And that gorge is 1,500 feet deep, maybe 2,000 foot deep. Um, there are cliffs all along it. It's pretty inaccessible. There are places you can cross occasionally with an ATV, but a bunch of it you can't even hike across. Most of the creeks in our area are seasonal, although the larger ones like White Creek, Coal Creek, and Soap Creek run all year round. But in August and September, they're reduced to a trickle. There are fish and stuff, but they're often quite small come August and September. But the area as we learned over time, is full of amazing, significant natural resources. This picture is one of the more important ones. It's called Grassy Cove. It's the largest sinkhole in the United States. Water can only come in from the surface from rain, and it exits through an underground river. It's where some of the top caves in the U.S. are located, and it's a national geologic landmark because of its significance. My farm shares a four or five mile border with that property. And as we started looking around several years after we all lived there and I was raising my kids there, I realized that there are so many beautiful places on the Cumberland Plateau and beautiful natural places. And it's important that I sort of had to realize this on my own. I didn't have a realtor telling me to go to a particular website. Hey, George, you want to do fun, natural things? Go to this website. Everything you ever wanted to do on the Cumberland Plateau. It, it just didn't exist. And, and it wasn't well promoted what was there. There had been attempts at, at promotion with designations like Grassy Cove, I was just explaining, but it wasn't easy to access. In today's age of technology, it needs to be all right at your fingertips. No one has time to play around researching things. But we found stuff to do right around us. We all became bird watchers. On the far right is a northern bobwhite, very rare grassland bird that's important to us in our area. But for this group, what we discovered was paddling. I'm a late life paddler. I started maybe around 12 years ago. I'm a very good intermediate and probably won't get any better. My children have become excellent paddlers. 
fast forward to today, the one in the middle picture on the right, Sam is about to go to college in a month or two. He's turning 18 and he grew up on these creeks around here, paddling them, hiking them, swimming down them, etc. At one point, when we really started exploring the area, we fell in love with this creek called Clear Creek. It's the perfect creek for our level and for the kids' level. It's maybe a class two plus with maybe one three minus rapid in it. But most significantly, it's a federal wild and scenic river. And what's important about that, as you all know, but I didn't at the time, is that the federal designation of this creek really just makes it better. Easily, it makes it better for the people who are enjoying it, like ourselves, because when we park in the parking lot, it's safe. There might be a federal ranger. There's a clean bathroom. There's a changing area. People know that it's a well-accessed place and dangerous elements, which look for secluded areas, don't congregate here. So as a result of that, Clear Creek is a very popular destination on the Cumberland Plateau. It also runs seasonally, but because of the watershed, it it runs quite a lot. And for us, it became a regular go-to river. It really formed who my children are. When I realized how important that federal designation was, I began to ask questions and reach out to local paddling groups 10 years ago or so. And I started learning about the process of designations and what it meant for creeks and rivers. The federal designation was a bit out of my league. I'm just one person and it required a lot of heavy lifting. But I was fascinated by the state designation. And what was particularly interesting is that the the state designation had been tabled for some 15 years. There had not been a designation. It was dormant. This map right here is the area of my farm where you see where it says about Soak Creek and there's a little orange arrow. That's Grassy Cove. That backside of that's my farm. And these are the the watersheds and the rivers that run through it. If you look down the bottom half of the map, you'll see the blue area, which is Soak Creek. And then coming in from the bottom right is that little purple area, which is Piney. At some point, without my children, they weren't good enough and we didn't want to expose them to the dangers of outback creeking. We paddled White's Creek, Soak Creek, and the Piney River. And I'll never forget the feeling of going down these creeks so close to major cities where you felt like you're in Jurassic Park. There's just no hints of mankind. It's You are just in the middle of an Amazon-like water setting that is right out of a movie. It's just amazing that this exists so close to civilization. And after making some phone calls to some local stakeholders, the American Whitewater, the Nature Conservancy, I became excited by the opportunity to breathe life into the Scenic River Designation Program for the state of Tennessee. And I set myself towards trying to protect Soap Creek White or White's Creek. Those are the two that we were going to start with. When we started digging in a little bit into what was needed for state designation, it became even more exciting and, and really even more imperative that these creeks be preserved. This map that I'm showing you here is the NatureServe Rarity Weighted Richness Model of Critically Imperiled Species in the United States. The red is where it's critical. And when you see on the right side, that's the state of Tennessee. And right, there's a little dot right in the middle of that map. And that's where my farm is. And that's where Coal Creek is and Soap Creek and Piney River, all within, say, three miles of my house as the crow flies. When we realized the amount of biodiversity that existed in these creeks, we were able to access a lot of information that had already been done. We might have done a little bit of our own cataloging research, but most of this information existed. Someone had done it. Someone needed to pull it all together. And some of the facts that became apparent were how important the southeastern United States is for freshwater biodiversity. Nearly two-thirds of the United States fish species, 90% of the U.S. total mussel species, Half of the crayfish species are found in the southeast U.S. 40% of all U.S. freshwater species are at risk of extinction. And right in the Soap Creek, Piney River watershed, there are documented 110 different fish species, nine crayfish, 53 mussels, a total of 172 interesting species all call this place home. While some species have a wide range of habitat, There are some which we'll call one stream or one part of a river home. Those are called narrow endemic species. And the Southeast has more of these than anywhere in the country. Soak and Piney have their fair share of them. And if you're interested, you can reach out to me. I can try to pull out the information of what's there. But there's some examples are the laurel dace, the dromedary pearly mussel, the pyramid pig toe mollusk, the tangerine darter, uh, the purple bean mollusk, the hellbender salamander. And... It's not just in the creeks, but it's around the creeks, too. My favorite of all threatened species is the grasshopper lindemani, 
no coincidence that this grasshopper has my last name. It was named after me. And there's a cool picture of it because it was found on my property a year or two ago by some researchers who were cataloging bugs on the property. And they found this grasshopper, which had never been documented before. And so that's just an example of what's out there. We also dug into the economics of what a Soak Creek or a White's Creek designation would look like. And they're very compelling. I just put a few of these facts here. Everyone in this room knows them as well or better than I do. But what's important is that these creeks are often in rural counties where jobs are not readily found, and whitewater recreation is very important to local economies. We dug in a little bit as to which creek and what we wanted to, to do to try to get it done. We understood the political process, spoke to the senators, the local House members, to figure out what needed to be done, and we decided that for the first creek in 15 years, Soak was the one we were going to start with. White's Creek, perhaps it was more traveled and more important local creek, but there were too many landowners and too many complexities for a first designation. The Piney River was further away from my farm, so we just, just decided to, to start with the one that was nearby and then started the lobbying. And I don't mean necessarily just lobbying politicians. I mean lobbying anyone and everyone who would listen. We spoke to government groups, government organizations, government departments, elected officials. We spoke to nonprofits. We spoke to scholars. We spoke to every single landowner on the creek. We spoke to broad stakeholders, paddlers, hunters, bikers, hikers, and all of the groups that go with them. Well, when I say we, I mean myself and any organization that I could get to help me. Eventually, the 10 Green, a local group, and the Nature Conservancy of Tennessee agreed to help us with it, as well as American Whitewater, and, and they helped spearhead all of this. Between us, we had about 250 phone calls, six various trips down the river on rafts, 23 meetings. And finally, when Soak was designated, we took all of our partners on a rafting trip down um, Soak, which is not easy to, to coordinate on a wild and scenic river with not a lot of access and having to measure high water and make sure we got enough water to get down. Some people didn't know how to paddle, but we did it. And it was a wonderful uh, way to get people out and make them be grateful for what we had done. One of the things that we realized in the in the political process, and, and this is important for everyone in this room, understanding what the lay of the land is, because everyone has an opinion, everybody has an agenda, and the goal is to find out where your agenda might dovetail with someone else's agenda. In this instance, the Cumberland Trail, which is an important effort by the state of Tennessee to create this linear park that goes all the way across the state, the Cumberland Trail just happens to have several miles of frontage on Soak Creek and meanders through there. And there was a missing piece of the trail that they were always looking for. And when they heard that we were trying to uh, designate Soak, we got all the local trail people involved and the, the government officials who were very much interested in completing the Cumberland Trail, which is a statewide initiative. They signed on in helping us for the creek. And although everyone loves the idea of preserving a creek, they were interested in the trail and what we were doing dovetailed with what they were doing. So it's very important to try to find friends. And you might find them in kind of funky places. We found that the people who maintain the trails in the state of Tennessee and, and the various commissioners, and they ended up being some of our biggest allies. After about two years of work, the legislature signed off and designated Soak Creek, Tennessee's first scenic river in 15 years. You know, it was so much work to do that when it actually was signed, it was just a piece of paper. And I was like, wow, what's really changed here? Have, I, have we done anything? It was just a lot of work. But of course, that's what you feel like when you do a lot of work and you finally get to the end of the end of the tunnel. But it was worth it because it's done so much more than just preserving that creek. It's a building block. So besides obvious protections that the government brings, additional monitoring, it gives everyone the ability to find additional funding and to use this designation to be a springboard for other designations, for federal money to enhance the park, for infrastructure funds. Once SOAK was designated, local schools became more aware of it and started using the picnic ground at the base of SOAK Creek. And the, tra the Cumberland Trail got used more. So it has this domino effect where if you get one thing done, all of a sudden other things fall into place. I followed up this designation with a donation of about a thousand of acres of land that, that I own Creekside, ensuring that all of Soak Creek, except for maybe one or two very small parcels, would never be developed. And those parcels are committed not to develop on the Creekside. 
again, there's all these pieces of a puzzle that came together. The the Cumberland Trail people were so happy that I donated the land. The creek people are happy. Of course, the critters are happy and the economy is happy. It was a very exciting moment in retrospect as I sit here talking about it. When that was done is we had two more important creeks in our area that had to be done, White's Creek and the Piney River. Again, White's Creek I mentioned before, challenging because there are lots of individual owners. And when you get a lot of people, Tennessee is a very uh, strong owner's right state. Legislatures were nervous. They didn't want to offend constituents. Piney traveled mostly through state lands. And so Piney was was the obvious next next creek to do. And it's in the middle bottom of this map. It's the purple one. So Soak is the green one, which is a tributary of Piney. But even though Piney was mostly on state land, we still had to work it. It's amazing the obstacles that can come up. First was one landowner who decided that they were against the project and that made the local politician nervous and it got put on hold. After that, when we found a way around that problem, then there was a mapping problem and a turf war. Does the creek bed line start at the middle or is the property line on the side? And this wasn't about individual landowners. This was just, does the state control it or the county control it? Or there wasn't a fight over it, but there was disagreement and the lawyers couldn't figure out how to move forward until they redefined the property line. Once they did, that released the logger jams. We reached out to the neighbors. We started the whole process again. It took us less time, maybe 18 months or so, and Piney became the 16th state wild and scenic river in Tennessee sometime last year. Amidst the suffering and the misery of COVID, the politicians realized the importance of outdoor activities. And so, whereas a lot of the legislative priorities, which were not related to COVID and life safety issues, got tabled, but the Piney River designation didn't get tabled just because it was outdoor and because everyone was so focused on having a good time where the wind was blowing and where there was less risk. So it took us about a year and a half or two and we did it. It's so exciting. An entire watershed is now protected. It's available for all to use. And so many more people are are using it now and there's so much more press around it. And it's exciting for a resident to see all the people stopping and filling their cars with gas and buying sandwiches and enjoying the creek and hiking. And and as you all know, in this room, anyone who's going to drive a long way to to a natural area, there's a good chance that they're going to respect it. And those aren't the people who are going to spill oil in the water. You know, there are bad actors, but generally speaking, the people who use these two creeks and enjoy them, love them as much as I do, and are just so grateful to, to have the opportunity to enjoy them. You know, what's next? We still do a lot of research at Cove Creek, not just with Creek. We do a lot of grassland, native grass restoration, preservation, a lot of burning in order to recreate native grasses. We're experimenting with longhorn cows on the effect of of grazing a longhorn cow on cool seasons grass versus native grasses. And of course, it's all intertwined because the research is coming out now that native grasses that border water conveyances create filters of some kind and, and the water that goes into the creeks, if it goes through native habitat, it comes out cleaner. One of the things I've become aware of with all these different academic disciplines and how they relate to each other. So our next project, and I don't know if it will happen or not, but I'm quite excited about it. And I'm working on it along with White's Creek, which I would love to see designated, is the concept of a 10,000 acre grassland preserve right where Piney River and Soak Creek run through. The land is owned by one owner, and I'm hopeful that someday we can work with that one over to create Southeast's largest native grass habitat. And that grass will clean all the water that goes into these creeks and make sure that all those critters that live there don't die off the planet. So that's that's what we're working on. It just takes a lot of people and keep on trying. And all I can say for everyone in this room is it seems like a daunting task, every designation, every creek cleanup. But if people try hard enough, one by one, we'll be able to get the job done. So thank you all very much for listening to this rambling story, and I'm available for questions. And if you don't feel like asking the questions in front of everybody and you want to shoot me an email, please do so. I do try my hardest to answer everything. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity.